Welcome, hello and good morning. My name is Gabriella Cruz. I'm the Principal of Strategic Initiatives for the International Federation of Accountants. And it's my pleasure to help kick off this series. Um, this morning, we will be dealing with the important topic of International Standards of Quality Management One, Quality Management for Firms, Resources, Expectations for Firms and Engagement Partners. Just as a gentle reminder, attendees' microphones will be automatically muted throughout the webinar. Your videos will also be turned off. Um, if you cannot stay on this whole time, please note that this presentation is being recorded and is available on our website. We also strongly encourage you to use the Q&A button located at the bottom of the screen in the black toolbar to provide questions to the panelists, as opposed to using the chat to enter questions for presenters. The recording will be available shortly after the completion of the webinar and will be available on the IFAC page. And now it is with great pleasure that I hand it over to my friend and colleague, Natalie Kleneritis. Good morning and thank you, Gabby. Hello and welcome to today's webinar on resources in the quality management standards. My name is Natalie Clonarides. I am a deputy director here at the IAASB coming to you live from New York this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We certainly look forward to spending the next hour with you. Modernizing firm systems of quality management was one of the pivotal changes that the IAASB made in the new quality management standards. Over the last decade, firms have experienced the pressure of evolving technology, which has become such an essential element of engagement performance and firm management. People and how and where they work has transformed the profession. The world had no choice but to adapt to the unprecedented COVID crisis that was brought upon us just over a year ago. Resources have had to quickly adapt and adjust to thrive in the environment in which we now live. The modernization of the quality management standards could not have come at a more crucial time for the profession. Back in 2014, when the IAASB set out on this journey to revise the standards, never could we have imagined the transformation that the world and our profession would see in such a short period of time. So today we will hear more about the quality management standards and how they have become so essential for today's environment through embracing technology as well as changes in the firms, in, in the environment in which firms and engagement teams operate. So before we jump into the, the, the webinar today, just a bit of a recap on the first webinar in our series so far. So if we could turn to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. So in our first webinar, we explained that there are three quality management standards that form part of the, the suite of quality management standards. ISQM1, which is the quality management standard at the firm level, deals with the firm's responsibility for quality through having a system of quality management. ISQM2 deals with engagement quality reviews and ISA 220 revised deals with quality management at the engagement level for audits of financial statements. So the engagement partners' responsibilities for managing quality. Today's webin on today's webinar, you will hear a lot about ISQM1 and ISA 220 revised. If we could go to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. On our first webinar, we also explained the components that form part of ISQM1, as well as the other requirements that sit in the standard. And we covered the eight components that exist in the standard. The eight components, as a reminder, serve different purposes. So we have two components that are processes in nature, and that is the firm's risk assessment process, which we covered in our first webinar, and the monitoring and remediation process. There are components then that deal with things that the firm will need to be able to operate the system. And that is the resources component and the information and communication component. The governance and leadership component is, is of course very important because that creates the environment in which the system operates. And then we have a number of other components that deal with specific topics that are fundamental for engagement performance. On our first webinar, we also walked through the firm's risk assessment process in detail and answered some of your questions there. If you were not able to join us for that webinar or have not yet watched it, it is available on our YouTube channel. As I mentioned on today's webinar, we will be focusing on resources 
and really explaining the firm's responsibility for resources, as well as the engagement partner's responsibilities for human resources at the engagement level, and just really explaining that interlinkage between the two. Our other two webinars that are coming up in August will cover monitoring and remediation, um, and our final webinar will cover other key aspects of ISQM1. So if we could take the slides off. Oh, if we could uh, take the slides off, please. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. So on today's webinar, we are joined by two of our board members who are live with us from the UK, Josephine Jackson and Sue Almond. Josephine and Sue, please say hello and introduce yourselves. Hi, good afternoon from London, everyone. It's actually a real pleasure to be here today and great to see so many participants and still climbing. So I'm Josephine and as well as being an IWSB board member, I work for the Financial Reporting Council, which is a UK regulatory body. And at the FRC, I'm the Director of International Auditing and Assurance Standards and Policy. I was also a member, in fact, of the ISO 220 and the Quality Management Task Forces and like Natalie, delighted to see the approval of those standards last year. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Josephine, and um, and hello, hello everybody. I'm also delighted to be here. Um, Sue Armand, I'm a board member of the IWSB since January 2020, and I was also a member of the ISQM1 task force. Um, most recently, I have been head of assurance at Grant Thornton International, and I've also worked with a number of um, smaller networks around uh, some of the quality issues. So, really looking forward to your questions later. Great, thank you, Josephine and Sue. And we certainly are very fortunate to have both of you with us today and really look forward to your presentation. To our participants, of course, we would also like to still hear from you as well. So please don't forget to submit your questions through the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom panel. Uh, Josephine and Sue will first present some slides and, and take us through the resources pieces of ISQM1 and ISA220. And following that, we will then turn to your questions. We, of course, will endeavour to answer as many questions as we can on today's webinar. But of course, if we do run out of time, we will, we will certainly try to answer any remaining questions on our final two webinars that are coming up in August. We often receive questions through our panel on whether the presentation will be made available. And following the webinar today, we will make the presentation available through our web page. So Josephine and Sue, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to kick off here um, and, and really focusing on the resources element in, in ISQM1, as Natalie has said. So in, in order to perform engagements, firms need resources. They also need resources to operate the system of quality management. And those resources would include human technology, technological, intellectual resources, as well as financial resources. And managing the firm's resources properly involves obtaining and planning and scheduling and allocating resources in the best way possible for the firm and for its stakeholders. Firms need to ensure that there's roughly in, there's enough resource capacity to perform engagements and to operate the system of quality management. From an operational perspective, firms may want to make sure that the resource um, utilization is, is efficient but at the same time, resources need to be utilised in a way that ensures engagement quality is achieved and the system runs properly. Having enough resources is not only about the quantity of resources available to the firm, it's about having enough of the right resources to be able to perform engagement and operate the system of quality management. Utilisation of resources in a firm, in particular human resources, can be really quite complex. The firm's staff often have concurrent tasks on a particular assign assignment or work on multiple engagements, or they may have both client and internal leadership responsibilities. So keeping track of resource utilisation helps the firm Im improve and, and monitor its quality. Having enough time to do something is really important to quality, and potential overutilisation of staff is something that needs to be carefully monitored. Equally, resources that look to be potentially underutilised may be able to be deployed somewhere else, such as performing some per periodic monitoring activities or developing and attending training updates with appropriate um, direction and supervision, obviously. The bottom line here is that firms really need to understand and proactively manage what resources they need 
how much of those resources they need, when they need it, and how it's going to be assigned and how it's going to be used, and to be flexible and responsive to changes in those needs. ISQM1 covers four types of resources, human resources, technological resources, intellectual resources, and those are things like methodologies, guides, checklists, um, and financial resources. And the resources are dealt with in two places in ISQM1. The governance and leadership component deals with the leadership element um, and the responsibilities for resources and looking at the alignment of resource allocation with the firm's culture. It deals with all the resources, um, and this, this component specifically includes financial resources. And then there's a more detailed element of the, the resources component, and that deals with more of the, um, the perhaps more detailed elements of human, technological, and intellectual resources. ISQC1, which is the current standard that, um, that, that firms are operating under, at the moment only deals with human resources. So it's important to be aware that the other resource types that we've got here on the slide are new to ISQM1. Also, ISQC1 only focuses on human resources at the engagement level, whereas ISQM1 um, focuses on all the human resource needs for both engagements and for the system of quality management itself. So what we have here is a more holistic approach to resources, addressing the various types of the resources, which is one of the key changes that Natalie mentioned that was made to modernize the standard and to better reflect the environment in which firms operate. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a bit about human resources and what's considered to be a human resource. So human resources may be internal or external to the firm. And that distinction is important because the way in which the firm influences how the people work may differ. And so there are some differences in the requirement in ISQM1. There's a few definitions in ISQM1 that are around um, who are considered to be internal, um, but those haven't really changed from, from ISQC1, although they have been mod modernized a bit to reflect changes to how the firms operate. So the first definition is personnel. And as defined, it includes partners and staff in the firm. What's important here is to, to think about what in the firm means. So is anyone working within the firm or another structure in the firm? And I'm sure you're aware some firms have structures where there are service delivery centers in other regions, for example. And those, the, the staff in those, part, in those service delivery centers would then be personnel and considered um, as personnel of the firm. The second definition to look at is the term staff, and that's defined as professionals, included any experts employed by the firm. And then the third definition that's important is, is the concept of the engagement team. Engagement teams are referred to throughout ISQM1, but it, it's an important fundamental concept in ISA 220 revised, which looks at the engagement level requirements. And that's a definition that has changed in the suite of quality management standards. And uh, Josephine's going to speak to that in a few minutes. We've mentioned personnel and staff in the firm, but in many instances, the firm may use uh, individuals that are external to the firm. So sometimes they'll use people who don't work directly for the firm, either in the system of quality management or at the engagement level. For example, a firm may use external people such as a training provider to help with engagement quality reviews, or they may use a, an external individual such as a specialist consultant to help perform specific procedures on an engagement. External people that come from the firm's network, um, that, or the external people may come from the firm's net network, or it may be that they're, they're from an external service provider, and we'll look at those in a little bit more detail later. So the, no, but the notion that the firms may use people externally wasn't explicitly addressed in ISQC1. So again, this is a new concept in ISQM1. ISQM1 includes both the people that the firm uses on engagements, as well as the people that the firm uses to operate the system of quality management, such as the people who are used for consultation or dealing with, dealing with ethics compliance or perform the monitoring work. So, between ISQM1 and ISA 220 revised, the individuals or the human resources that are addressed by the standards now cover 
that complete suite of all the individuals that are involved in engagements and in the system of quality management, both internal and external. Josephine. Thanks, Sue. So Sue was just talking about people the firm uses on engagements and uh, and again, and for those listening in will know, when a firm uses people on engagements, some of those may not actually be employees of the firm. So we're going to take a closer look at how the definition of the engagement team has changed. And I will talk about who may or may not be included in the engagement team. So if we could move to the next slide, please. That's marvellous, thank you. So, and as you can see from a left column in the first part of the definition, that's not changed. It still includes all partners and staff performing the engagement. But as we can see from the second piece, it has actually been amended. So although it still refers to any individuals who perform procedures on the engagement, it no longer indicates that these individuals are engaged by the firm or network firm. Now you might ask, why did we make this change? It seems quite subtle, what's really different? Well, essentially, as Natty says, there's been an evolution in engagement team structures with team members located in different locations, regions, and particularly the case in recent times, as Natalie has pointed out. And of course, not all team members are necessarily employed by the firm. Firms these days have a variety of contracts and arrangements with the people they use on engagements for various different reasons. So take, for example, component auditors. They're often a critical part of a whole network of people involved in a group audit, but they're not necessarily employed by the firm or a network firm. So the fundamental concept here to remember is that if someone's performing procedures on the engagement, then they should be following the requirements of the ISIS for engagement teams. And this might be that they're subject to the independence requirements for the engagement, or it might relate to how their work is directed and reviewed, and of course, how they're supervised. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter where someone is located or how they are employed. If they're performing procedures on the engagement, then they're part of that engagement team, and they're all contributing to those final decisions and conclusions. Now, you might ask, what about people providing technical support on consultations or even engagement quality reviewers? So as Sue indicated a little bit earlier, they're actually excluded from the definition because they're not performing procedures on the engagement. In addition, an engagement quality review is actually control of the firm. It's at that firm level and it's a control to challenge the judgments made by the engagement team. Again, though, that reviewer is not performing procedures on the engagement. So consistent, though, with the previous definition, auditors, external experts and entities, internal auditors are excluded. And this is because the practitioner performs engagement procedures on the work of those individuals to make their own evaluations and draw their own conclusions for the purpose of the engagement. And those individuals are also specifically dealt with in other ISA standards. So as I inferred to earlier, the change in the definition clearly has an effect on group audits because it brings in any component auditors into the scope of the engagement team. And this change has helped clarify those really important references in ISA 600 today that those aspects of ISA 220, such as direction, supervision and review, also extend to component auditors, regardless of whether those component auditors are from the same firm, another firm in the same network or from a non-network firm. So although the requirements for engagement teams extend to component auditors, the approach to how the firm or the engagement partner address component auditors may actually differ. And that's depending on whether they're internal to the firm or external. And we are going to actually cover that off a little bit as we go through this presentation. I should actually mention that the IWSB is currently in the process of updating ISA 600, which is the standard that addresses special considerations for group audits. And we're hoping to approve that standard in December this year, and this will bring some further clarity to how the revisions in ISO 220 affect component auditors. So it is really important to remember, though, that ISO 220 still applies to group audits, even before the change to the engagement team definition. It's just that ISO 600 builds on top of ISO 220 to address those specific matters that arise in group audits. Now, I've started to talk a bit more about ISA 220 here, so I thought it'd be useful to talk about what ISA 220 says about engagement teams. So if we could pop to the next slide, please. Thank 
Thank you. So firstly, it's important to note that the ISA, sorry, that the focus of ISA 220 is on the leadership responsibilities of the engagement partner for managing the audit and, of course, achieving a quality audit. But part of managing an audit is, of course, managing the people involved. And that, of course, includes the engagement team. So ISA 220 includes a number of requirements to deal with what the engagement partner should do in managing the engagement team. Now, on the slide across, we've summarised these requirements, but I'm not going to go through all of them in any detail at all. But you can see how it's really important to remember that the requirements here apply to all members of the engagement team. For example, it's important that people working on the engagement have the competence and capabilities to do the work. And it shouldn't matter what firm they work for when they're part of that engagement team or where they're located. The partner should always be making sure they're appropriately skilled to deliver on the work that's needed. Similarly, the engagement partner needs to make sure that the work people do on the engagement is appropriately directed and supervised, and that work is being reviewed, regardless of who the people work for. Now, in really big audits, it might not be possible for the engagement partner to keep track of all this and do all of this on their own. So ISO 220 acknowledges that there are some things the engagement partner can assign to individuals who are appropriately skilled for that assignment, which may include some of these things listed on the slide. However, important also to remember that the engagement partner still remains ultimately responsible and therefore accountable for compliance with ISA 220. And the, the ISA actually explains upfront which requirements can be assigned to others and which tasks actually need to be performed by the engagement partner, such as reviewing the significant judgments made. And some of those requirements already exist today. Now, you might be thinking, how do I, as an engagement partner for my firm, do some of these things when people are working for another firm, you know, such as is the case with the component auditor. So ISA 220 now includes a lot of guidance on how the engagement partner might approach external people. For example, for relevant ethical requirements, in order to inform external people of these, the, the engagement partner might communicate them through instructions together with information about how people should report to the engagement partner if there's been a breach. But for people working in the same firm, then they're already likely aware of the relevant ethical requirements and their responsibilities through the firm's training programmes and other activities or procedures. For direction and supervision, if it was a group audit, for example, this might be something the engagement partner delegates to someone else at the component. So there might be a more senior individual, such as a partner of the other firm, providing the direction and oversight of the team members. And whereas for the internal people on, say, a much smaller engagement, the engagement partner will be providing much more direct oversight of the team members. So it really does depend on the circumstances. In reviewing the audit work, the engagement partner may review the engagement part, sorry, the engagement files that are in the engagement team, um, in the engagement team software and what they've already done, and they may do that directly. But when it comes to a group audit, because there are so many different circumstances, there'll be lots of different ways the engagement partner will approach reviewing component auditors' work. So let's go back to ISQM1 and now take a look at how ISQM1 addresses human resources and the differences in whether they are internal or external. So can we pop to the next slide, please? Thank you. OK, so although ISQM1 extends to individuals external to the firm, it doesn't mean that the firm's responsibilities for its own personnel are going to be the same as individuals external to the firm. The way that human resources are addressed in ISQM1 differs depending on the situation. And that's what we set out in these three, box, four, three boxes here. So there are many requirements in ISQM1 that apply to all individuals, both internal and external. And many of these requirements deal with matters related to engagement teams, such as I said before, direction, supervision and review, addressing differences of opinion and how information is actually exchanged between the firm and the engagement teams. A lot of what you see under these requirements are also, of course, reflected in ISO 220 in the context of the engagement partner's responsibilities. There are also some requirements that deal with the function of individuals performing activities within the system of quality management. For example, ISQM1 requires that the firm assign competent individuals to perform activities in the system of quality management. And sometimes those individuals may actually be excelled to the firm. For example, some firms might contract in individuals from another firm or another organisation to actually perform monitoring procedures. 
And these are known as service providers. But I'm actually going to leave that there because Sue's actually going to cover service providers a little bit later on. There are requirements in ISQ and one that apply only to the firm's personnel, so the internal people. And many of these requirements relate to cultural matters or the behaviour of individuals within the firm. And this is because the firm's culture simply can't extend beyond the parameters of the firm. So the culture is limited to the firm's own personnel. And actually, while I'm on the topic of culture, the UK FRC held a conference recently about audit firm culture. And there were some very interesting sessions on building an audit firm culture that supports high quality audit. And you may find that useful or helpful. You can actually listen to those recordings of the sessions by Googling FRC audit firm culture and just follow the relevant links to those, those recordings. And, and a lot of what's said in, those, uh, in that conference is, of course, consistent with what we're trying to achieve at the IWSB. Anyway, back to QM1. These requirements also tend to deal with things like hiring personnel or training them or undertaking performance evaluations, because again, the firm can't be responsible for, say, performance evaluations of individuals outside the firm. This is about the firm's responsibilities. Finally, there are requirements in ISQM1 that apply only to external individuals. These are quite limited and include instances such as relevant ethical requirements, a requirement where the firm is expected to identify when it needs to obtain human resources externally, because the firm just does not have that resource internally. And the relevant ethical requirements piece is actually very important, and just the circumstances when the ethical requirements have provisions that apply to the external individuals because of the role they're performing for the firm. For example, if there are a member of engagement teams, um, so if they are a member of the engagement team, the ethical code that the firm applies may scope in the external individuals as part of the engagement team. And there may be independence rules that then apply to those people. Certainly this would be the case with audit, but remember ISQM1 also applies to the firm's other engagements within the scope of the standard. Now, although there are requirements that apply to all individuals, both internal and external, similar to what I explained about ISO 220, there are going to be different approaches in how the firm addresses those requirements for personnel in the firm and individuals external to the firm. And this is because individuals external to the firm are not responsible for complying with the firm's system of quality management or implementing the firm's policies or procedures. So they just don't work for the firm. So if you think about the requirements around competence and capabilities of the individual, for example, some of that is addressed through the firm's recruitment and training processes for those personnel in the firm, but can't actually apply to those external to the firm. For example, let's say the firm has started an internal training program on IFRS 17 to get audit teams up to speed for their 2023 audits, where IFRS 17 knowledge is critical. For people external to the firm who will be involved in those audits, the firm's policies and procedures would likely to address this matter through other actions. One example of this is engaging directly with those individuals when the time comes, perhaps through direct discussion or questionnaires, so that the firm or the engagement partner can determine that the individual's knowledge in IFRS 17 is actually sufficient for the audit. So we've actually covered a lot in terms of what ISO 220 contains regarding engagement teams and the engagement partner's responsibilities and what ISQM1 deals in terms of human resources. And probably from me speaking, it might seem that there's a lot of overlap between the two, i.e. the firm's doing things and engagement partners doing similar things and there's duplication. So let me explain a bit about who needs to do what. And I'm going to use an example of how this might work rather than map out all the technical connections. So I'm actually going to use the assignment of staff to engagements as the example here, something that almost everyone will be familiar with. So if we could move on to the next slide, please, and we can chat through that one. Thank you. There we go. So in the green box, ISQM1 includes a quality objective and the resources component that engagement team members are assigned to engagements. There's also a piece here that addresses the competence and capabilities of the engagement team members, but we're going to put that aside and I've actually covered quite a bit of that already. So the firm would identify and assess quality risks related to this quality objective and design and implement responses to address those risks. So what sort of responses would they be? We think about how a firm might approach this. The responses might include various things. So the firm might obtain or develop 
uh, an IT application that's used to assign people to engagement and track where they're assigned. This application would have data about the firm's staff, their level within the firm, their holidays and clients that they're assigned to and, and so forth. The firm could potentially have someone or a team of people responsible for managing the staff allocations using the IT application. In one of the firms I worked for, there was a whole team dedicated to this. and It was called the staff department, and they were often our very best friends. <laughs> but they would exactly be doing this kind of work. And then the firm would have policies or procedures that set out who's responsible for requesting the staff for the engagement and the process they need to follow. So in a larger firm, perhaps the engagement partner is required to submit or approve a request form, perhaps even through the IT application directly. But in a smaller firm, it might be more informal where people just speak to the administrator about their engagement needs. The administrator would then process the request and assign staff. Also, the firm probably would have policies and procedures to deal with busy periods. So perhaps engagement partners are asked to submit or approve requests well in advance for those engagements so that the administrators can assess all requests and work out how best to assign people. And, uh, and of course, if they foresee any staff shortages, they can address it. Perhaps also there might be periodic meetings with firm management to discuss staff utilisation and whether there are any issues. And the firm would also likely have policies and procedures for dealing with requests that happen while the engagement is in progress. For example, an issue is identified and more staff with say, specific skills are needed to perform engagements or perform procedures. And those policies and procedures might also say what the engagement partner needs to do in such a situation. Now we're in the blue box and we're thinking about what the engagement partner might do under ISO 220. So before time, they would plan ahead on what staff they might need to perform the engagement. And then they would follow the firm's policies and procedures and submit the request for staff. Now, the engagement partner would then check that staff have been assigned and consider whether the individuals are appropriate for the engagement. Now, if the engagement partner is not happy with the people assigned, they would go back to the administrator and raise a concern, which the administrator would try to resolve. However, sometimes the engagement partner might find themselves still in a difficult situation, even after going through this process. And ISO 220 does actually explain that in some cases, the engagement partner may need to design and implement responses at the engagement level beyond what's in the firm's system. So for resources specifically, ISO 220 indicates if the engagement partner determines that resources assigned are inappropriate, the engagement partner has to take appropriate action. For example, depending on the size of the firm, the engagement partner may need to speak to other engagement partners directly to release staff or come to another agreement. So the bottom line here is that the engagement partner can depend on the firm's policies and procedures and follow them in dealing with the staff assigned to the engagement. But if the engagement partner is not ultimately satisfied with staff assigned to the engagement, they do need to take further actions in accordance with ISO 220 and that's to make sure that they can manage and achieve a quality audit. Now, hopefully that helps with understanding how the standards interact and where the various responsibilities lie. But Sue, I think that's probably enough for me from me for now on human resources. So I'm going to hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Josephine. And we're, we're now going to move on to some of the other um, elements in the in the resources section. So we've spoken a lot about human resources. Um, I want to turn now the, to, to the, um, the areas of technological and intellectual resources. So technological resources is a new concept that's been introduced in ISQM1, and it's one of the changes that, that's been made to modernise the standard. The uh, existing standard ISQC1 doesn't mention top technology, and in fact, it doesn't deal with intellectual resources either. And yet these are a very critical part of performing engagements. Um, engagement teams depend very heavily on things like the firm's methodologies and guides and, and, um, and, and checklists. Sorry, and I've forgotten to ask to move to the next slide, so my apologies if I'm confusing people. Um, so what, what ISQM1 is really getting at is, is that the firm needs to obtain or develop the technological and intellectual resources that it needs in order to be able to operate the system of quality management or to be able to perform engagements. And once those uh, resources have been obtained or developed, it's also really important that they are properly maintained and used in an appropriate manner to deliver quality on an ongoing basis. So, for example, with intellectual resources, 
it's important that they are consistent with the applicable for professional standards and the legal and regulatory requirements. So it's important that the firm's methodology is up to date or is, is um, made up to date for any new auditing standards in time for the effective um, date. This, um, this component also covers the um, technological resources that firms need to operate the system or perform engagements. Um, and that sounds like it's quite wide. So let's, let's think about what that means, that, that element of technology. It's not all technology used by the firm. ISQM1 is only looking at the technology that's needed for the system of quality management and for engagements. And that largely falls into three different categories. The first is designing technological resources that are used in designing, implementing, or operating the system of quality management. You've then got technological re resources that are used by engagement teams in the performance of engagements. And then sitting potentially above that is, is technological resources that are essential to enabling the effective operation of IT applications. So that first bucket where we're thinking about technology for the system of quality management, that could be things like applications that the firm uses for independence monitoring, maybe for time recording or assigning staff, some of the things Josephine was talking about, perhaps a system for archiving files when they're completed, um, and perhaps the way that the, the system also within that kind of um, process triggers alerts or escalations if there are exceptions um, or if, if certain um, criteria aren't met. The second category around technology for engagement teams, um, most firms will have some kind of application for their working, pro, working papers, so some kind of um, auto, um, audit file uh, with, with audit programs, possibly automated, um, or some kind of automated disclosure checklist. Those kind of things are very common these days in practice. Um, and, and as well as that, engagement teams will use a variety of applications, perhaps for data analytics um, purposes, and that, and that includes Excel, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute. And then the final bucket is this overarching piece of technology. It's the technology that's needed so that the applications can function. So things like operating systems, the databasing systems, um, making sure that the appropriate systems upgrades are implemented and that piece also includes the hardware. So thinking about what hardware the, the staff needs to be able to fulfill their roles. And again, making sure that they're, they're obtaining the hardware and maintaining it. Now I wanted to come back to Excel because um, this, is a, this is a tool that's commonly used and it's a great example of something where there are really good opportunities for in, innovation, but there are also risks built in there. And many, many times in the task force meetings, we, we used Excel and the various experiences we've had as, it, as an example of, of some of the, um, uh, the challenges. And a particular case that we came across fairly, fairly regularly and fairly consistently across um, all sorts of organizations was when engagement teams developed their own complex macros or templates. And then suddenly those macros or templates have been shared around the firm and, and there's a, a load of audit teams using something that hasn't really been vetted or tested. So I would just say to you, think, think about things like that, because while it's absolutely appropriate to encourage innovation and proactivity, um, if, if those macros or the templates aren't running properly or they're being used for a purpose that is different to what they were developed for, they could end up giving some incorrect answers without people really questioning the answer. Uh, and, and the output. So it's a good example of where a firm might want to think about the quality risks and how it handles some of these things that are developed by individual engagement teams or that are then subsequently in, uh, used by, by multiple engagement teams. So it's not to say that these kind of applications are, are not a good thing, but it's about thinking about the quality risks. And what we've seen in practice that is that to manage some of these quality risks, um, some firms might outright prohibit certain certain applications that haven't been um, vetted by the firm or in some cases the firms will develop policies and procedures for engagement teams to follow that set out what needs to be tested before using um, an application or a macro or what have you or what needs to be done before sharing a, a template more widely 
So it's an illustration, but I think it's something to be very conscious of. As I say, it crops up really consistently in the discussions we had. In our first webinar, um, we, we covered quality risks and, and we explained that um, there are conditions or events, circumstances that the firm is required to understand to, to identify their quali quality risks. One of the um, conditions or, or for, for technology, the kind of um, condition that we're in is, is the notion that the, the resources themselves can, can give rise to a quality risk. And that, that's, that's probably the discussion that we've just had. So um, for technology, when you're thinking about um, whether it might affect uh, another quality risk, it's um, maybe thinking about um, licensing a, a data analytic tool from a small enterprise that's just started thinking, uh, just, just started in business. So as well as, the, as well as the risk relating to the technological resource itself, there may also be impacts around um, what would happen if the enterprise didn't stay in business or what about the, the data security if they're handling client data. So probably within the, in the technology piece, um, it, it also flows more directly into the other quality risks as well. If we can have the next slide, please. I'm going to move on to talking about service providers. Um, and, and as we've said previously, we're seeing more and more that firms are using external parties for a number of things. And, and I've already seen a number of examples actually coming up in the Q&A. Um, so from people to technology, firms are using service providers to help them deal with, with all the things that the firm needs to operate and perform engagements because firms simply don't have the, the resources internally or the specialization to be able to, to develop and maintain resources. That's, that's the case in, in the smaller firms. Um, many of those firms will use IT service providers to, to provide IT service support, um, or they may use external people such as training providers for consultation on technical matters or to perform engagement quality reviews. And they may purchase IT applications, uh, just as I, I mentioned earlier about audit files um, and audit methodology or data analytics. And, and within that, the firm's information and data may even be served, stored on the service provider's cloud. Larger firms, while they may have um, more expertise in-house, absolutely very much uh, you know, still use service providers. Josephine mentioned earlier about um, component auditors, and, I, and I'd like to just remind us here about the um, when we've got firms performing group audits, the need to be really aware that um, component auditors perform, performing work at, at that component are in this service provider um, bucket if they're not from, an, uh, from a, within the same, same network as the, the audit firm. Um, we'll come on to networks on another webinar. But this, this is because component auditors are a human resource that the firm is using to perform its engagement. Uh, and as we've talked about earlier, the definition of engagement teams um, includes component auditors. And it's an interesting one here because in, in many cases, the firm itself may not actually be the, the entity engaging the component auditor because maybe management of the, um, of the group will make that choice or the component auditor may be engaged by component manager. So there are um, a number of things to, to consider about the, um, uh, the group audits. And I think Josephine covered that previously. So it's important, as I mentioned earlier, that, that um, resources from networks are dealt with separately from service providers. Um, and we, when we talk about a network, we mean anything that comes from the network organization itself or from another firm or another structure within that same network. So if the firm's using things like the network audit methodology, quality management framework, consultation, and so on, that's included. And as I said, our final webinar will cover more on, on, on networks. So we've talked about service providers, but I, I want to emphasize something that's really important for the board discussions when we talked about service providers. And that's while firms can use um, service providers within the system of quality management, they can't outsource the responsibility for the system. The firms are responsible for their system. Um, and while a service provider may be able to help them, the firm still has to take an active role in their system and in taking responsibility for the output. output. So in terms of what ISQM1 requires when it comes to using resources from a service provider, well, it's really two things. 
Firstly, that the firm identifies the need. And then secondly, when it's using external resources to make sure that the resource from the service provider is appropriate for use in the system and in, at, or in performing engagements. And when we're thinking about um, whether it's appropriate for use, thinking about the quality objectives, uh, and if we think about an example of technological resource, we've got a quality objective that the technological resource being appropriately implemented, maintained. So in the context of getting that technological resource from a service provider, the firm may need to probe about how that resource will be appropriately um, implemented, maintained by that service provider and how they're going to do it in order to meet the technology quality objective. So I think, Natalie, that probably has taken us through the various um, headings that we had um, under the, uh, the system. And I'll hand back to you for the questions. Great. Thank you so much, Sue and Josephine. That was a really comprehensive presentation. And I think you've really highlighted there a lot of those complexities in terms of the, the various responsibilities of the firm and the engagement partner and how those really come together. So thank you so much for, for the very comprehensive presentation there. Um, so having a look at our Q&A panel, we've had quite a few questions coming through, which is it's really great to, to see our participants sending those questions. Um, the one I wanted to pick up here, actually the first one, and I think this has probably come from um, some SMP folks, um, a couple of questions in this, in this regard. And I think this one, Sue, perhaps if you could answer for us, and, and that's around you know, you were talking about um, technology and ISQM1. And the question coming up here is, is does ISQM1 actually now require or expect a firm to use technology? Sure, thanks. And I can see some of these questions here. Um, I, th I think it's probably worth saying right, right at the outset, there isn't a requirement there for firms to use technology. So, so the answer is, is absolutely in a no, it is not uh, a requirement. Um, it requires the firm to obtain and develop the, the technology that's needed for, for the system and to perform engagements. So if the firm decides that it doesn't need technology, then it, that there isn't a requirement to do that. Um, what I would say is I've tried to, I've tried to build in the, the examples as we were speaking to, to reflect that I think you know, our experience of even very small firms is that they are using technology in, in some way. So um, I would expect it to be common, but there isn't a requirement. Um, and may, maybe I can just pick up on, there was a question coming through about scalability as well, because we spent a lot of time working and thinking about the scalability here. It's all about thinking about what the particular risks are and how the firm can address it. And, you know, if you are in a position where um, there are very limited risks, then there, there will be very limited responses. So I, I think um, there, there'll probably be more to come on scalability, I'm sure, but it is something that I think we tried very hard to address within the standard itself. Great, thank you so much, Sue. Um, I think another question coming up here that I've seen on the on the panel, um, and again, probably uh, more for our smaller firms as well, but of course, these days, firms do use a lot more um, service providers. So I think, you know, in the smaller firm, you know, using a lot of engagement quality reviewers, IT experts, um, you know, as we mentioned in the presentation as well, around group audits and um, component auditors also coming in there as service providers. So when we cast our minds to the, the firm's risk assessment process and identifying and assessing quality risks, one of the questions that's come up here is, is does a firm actually need to go and identify quality risks for every single resource that's coming from service providers? Perhaps you maybe if you could just explain that a little bit more for us. Sure, and, and I think um, firms will need to sort of maybe just take a step back and think about what's, what's relevant in their environment. But if, if I sort of speak about some of the networks I've seen, I think there are probably different ways of, of cutting this and slicing it. Um, clearly, if there are a number of service providers, then it may be overly granular to, to work, walk through each of these one by one. And there may be ways in which you can sort of pull them together and, and, and perhaps categorize them so that some of the similar risks are being picked up in, in a similar way. Um, so, for example, you might have um, off the shelf applications um, versus things that have been specifically developed or tailored for the individual firm. Th those risks might be different. Um, there, there might be different types of, um, uh, of, of, of um, 
service providers that you're looking at or, or different purposes for, for what things are being used at. And I think categorizing those together so that if you've got some similar themes, you can address those at one time or at least or at least develop a number of questions that you want to you want to ask in, in particular areas. So I think those are those are probably some of the key things to think about. Yeah, and I think I think Sue, this is also just triggering a thought a thought in my mind uh, about some of the work that we did on two hundred and twenty. Um, and maybe Josephine, this is maybe a good question for you. Actually, um, you know, when it came to two hundred and twenty, we introduced this notion of automation bias, and we dealt with that in, in two hundred and twenty a little bit. And I think Josephine, you've also been very involved with the work of our technology working group. Um, maybe if you, I don't know if you have any further thoughts to share on this. Um, uh, yeah, Natalie, that's right. So IC220 actually discusses the unconscious auditor biases of which automation bias is one of them. In fact, also the IESPA code now also includes automation bias as one of the helpful examples to assist professional accountants, in particular recognising when bias could be a threat to their professional judgment. Um, I mean, for those less familiar with the term, automation bias is someone when someone actually favours output generated from an automated system, even when human reasoning or other evidence actually contradicts that output. So when teams are using technology, it is an important bias to consider when thinking about impediments to professional skepticism and how they might be overcome. And in fact, um, and Sue's on the technology working group as well. So we were both part of the development of an FAQ uh, guide on technology that specifically considers how the auditor can address automation bias. And of course, what Sue was talking about earlier, the risk of over-reliance on technology more generally. And it is actually worth reading because it gives a few more practical, you know, everyday examples of when automation bias can occur. And, uh, and of course, expands on a number of solutions. And, and some of this, of course, is only very briefly mentioned in the standards. Great. Thanks, Josephine. Um, and yeah, I had forgotten there that Sue's also on our technology working group. So great to have you both with us on that point. Um, Josephine, something else uh, coming up here, and I think Sue, Sue covered the technology piece on during the presentation, but could you maybe just cover around technology at the engagement level and, and what, was, what are the engagement partners' responsibilities when it comes to technology? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, as Sue mentioned, it is actually the firm's responsibility to obtain or develop the technological resources, as well, of course, making sure they're properly maintained. And most firms have audit software tools, and some may also have a various um, or a variety of additional applications for data analytics purposes. Uh, but the firm is also responsible for making sure personnel are trained to use that technology and, you know, potentially have appropriate specialists in place when you're dealing with more complex technology. So, essentially a lot of that responsibility still sits with the firm first so but when you get to an audit an engagement partner has a responsibility to make sure they have sufficient they get sufficient and appropriate resources and that does of course include any technological resources they also have responsibility for making sure that those resources are used appropriately is everybody actually using it the way it's supposed to be used so in most cases when it comes to say audit software tools Unless the engagement partner comes across something to the contrary, then they can actually depend on those firms' policies and procedures in relation to the tools being used in the engagement. So ISA 220 actually goes into a lot of detail on this in the application material. And um, let's take the data analytics tool as, um, tools as an example. In determining that the engagement team is using those appropriately, and the engagement partner should look at the firm's policies and procedures because they're likely to include the required considerations or responsibilities for the engagement team when using the firm's technology and may even require involvement of the individuals I mentioned earlier that have those specialist skills. Perhaps in, you know, they need those skills in evaluating or analysing the output. Um, and, and Sue talked about Excel and various aspects of Excel. And in some circumstances, um, you know, if you think about all the different things you can do with Excel, the firm might actually prohibit the use of certain applications, IT applications, 
or specific features of them. So in that case, the engagement partner needs to ensure that the team do comply with those policies and don't just develop their own spreadsheets that are prohibited, say, by the firm. But, but to be fair, ISA 220 does have a lot of new material on the use of technology in the audit, including things that the engagement partner might need to think about when IT applications are used on the audit. So hopefully that's answered that question, Natalie. Great, thank you, Josephine. Um, Sue, so I think this one is probably going to come back to you over here. So this is the one about the going back to the service providers, actually. Um, and obviously, you were talking about service providers in the presentation. Um, so often networks or firms actually also have something called service centers. Um, so perhaps if you could just clarify for us, what is the difference between a service center and a service provider? That would be great. Thank you. Sure. And, and, and I would probably see the difference between the two as one being internal and one being external. So the, the, the service center or a service delivery center or something like that is, is the kind of things that firms or networks are setting up to, to do particular pieces of work. So, uh, you know, it may be that it's, it's tasks or procedures that are repetitive or that things like routine um, bank confirmations or roll forward of files, you know, all those kind of things. Um, and, and I know, you know, a number of networks have got, have got um, operations in, in places like India or Eastern Europe or um, uh, actually Mauritius is one I've never managed to get to. But, um, you know, so those kind of things, but they are under the direction of the, of the firm or, or, or in some cases the network. Um, whereas the service provider, I think, as I, as I referenced earlier, is, is not part of the firm. It's an external, um, very much an external provider that the firm commissions and is not under their, their kind of management and leadership. Great. Thank you, Sue. And I think we would all love to be in Mauritius <laughs> at the moment. Um, so I think just another question that's coming through, and this is going to actually to financial resources. Uh, so, Josephine, maybe if I can... Um, um, ask you uh, to answer this question. And it's it's going back, I think, early on in the presentation, we spoke about financial resources forming part of governance and leadership. And some of the questions coming through here is just around, you know, what are the what are the expectations for firms when it comes to financial resources and firm systems of quality management? Right, yeah. Um, so, and actually, I think you mentioned that financial resources is dealt with under the governance and leadership component. And actually, there's a very good reason for that, because it's leadership that has the influence and authority to allocate the financial resources. And we really wanted to make sure that leadership makes the right decisions when it comes to how those financial resources are allocated. Because if there's just not enough funding coming from the top, it makes it incredibly difficult for people in the firm to really get done what they need to. In, in pursuit of quality. Um, so uh, the financial resources piece in isq one is linked to planning for resource needs. So this gets to the heart of the firm's budgeting and strategic decision-making process, but in particular to ensure that how funds are utilised actually reflects the firm's commitment to quality and, of course, the consistent performance of quality engagement. So Financial resources, uh, of course, are needed to support the other resources in ISQM1. And by that, I mean exactly what we talked about today, human, technological and intellectual resources. And I mean the ones that are needed for engagement, as well, of course, as what's needed to actually operate the system of quality management as well. So for an engagement or an engagement level, the firm's allocation of financial resources might encompass providing the right personnel to perform the engagement, but also to provide the engagement teams with the um, ability to engage experts or physically visit certain locations. It, it's, it's at that level. So the firm does need to think about all its resource needs and consider that in the context of financial resources and, and plan and budget accordingly. I think the the other place that financial resources comes through is part of identifying and assessing quality risks, because the firm has, you know, as, as we've already said, the firm's required to understand the conditions, events and so forth in order to identify the quality risks. And one area they need to understand is the resources of the firm. So if you think about it, if a firm has really limited financial resources, that could give rise to quite a number of different quality risks in particular when it comes to having the right people and technology to perform engagements and um, and actually operate, as I said, operate the system itself. So 
Also, I suppose if you think about how financial resources are assigned in the firm, it could also have an impact on quality risks if the firm's assigning a disproportionate amount of financial resources, say, to its consulting practice at the cost of quality in the audit practice. So, so that is something to think about when you're looking at the quality risks. Um, hopefully that will help. Great, thank you, Josephine. Uh, Sue, I don't know if you have anything further to add here, just you know, from practical perspective. Yeah, I was, I was just there. gonna build quickly because there's also been some comments in the, in the questions around the, the cost of this. And um, I, I very much see ISQM1 being um, a kind of overarching piece about how you deliver quality. And, and in that context, it's very similar to the kind of quality standards you see in any business that you operate with day to day. And I think one of the benefits of, of um, putting some of these, these requirements into the leadership area around, um, around financial resources is, is facilitating the discussion about not just what firms do do and how they're going to, if, if they're going to do things, how they do them to a real quality level, but also to talk about what firms don't do, because those are the things that also sometimes generate risks and ultimately generate costs to the firm. So um, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a really important area and it, and it has facilitated some, some very good conversations. Unfortunately, we are out of time, Sue and Josephine. Um, so thank you so much for answering all of those questions. Um, certainly there, there are quite a few questions on the panel today and we will certainly endeavor to try and answer those questions on our next few webinars that are coming up. Um, alternatively, some of those questions I think are answered in our first time implementation guide. Um, so just talking of our implementation support, um, as a reminder, we have published our first time implementation guides for ISQM1 and ISQM2. Those are available for download from our webpage. They really focus on complex areas of the standards with quite a few examples and, and really walk through those standards. So really encourage folks to take a look at those guides. Our ISA 220 guide, which we spoke about um, ISA 220 a lot today, that is in the process of uh, being developed and we, we aim to publish that by the end of the third quarter. Um, we still have the fact sheets, um, those are more high level summaries of the standards, a number of videos are available through our YouTube channel, uh, including a video of initial implementation efforts and things to start thinking about in terms of getting going, implementing ISQM1. Of course, all our webinars, as we mentioned, are also available on our YouTube channel. Uh, webinar one is there already, um, and we have our upcoming webinars coming up in August on August 5th for monitoring and remediation as well as August 18th for all the various other aspects of ISQM1. So really encourage folks to look at those resources um, to, um, to help you with the implementation of ISQM1. Um, just a reminder, if you wanna follow, um, follow us and stay up to date with all of our developments, please follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, our quality management webpage also has all of the resources that we have mentioned on the previous slide. So please be sure to visit that page. Thank you to our speakers, Josephine and Sue, you were fabulous. So thank you so much for sharing all of your insights today. Uh, thank you also to our, my IFAC colleagues, Gabby and Vanessa for assisting us with, the, with, with the, all the arrangements today as well, very much appreciated. Uh, and thank you to all our participants also for joining us today. It was a pleasure spending the last hour with you. My name is Natalie Klonaridis and have a great day. Thank you. And that concludes our webinar. Um, as you close out,